We're now joined by Professor Robert Bragg from the Veterinary Biotechnology Research Group in the Department of Microbiology and Biochemistry of the University of the Free State. Prof, thank you so much for your time. Perhaps uh, let's start at the beginning, especially now because uh, so many people have been impacted uh, by this shortage. What is avian influenza and where did it come from in this particular case? Well, as the name suggests, it's a, a virus, a virus that infects poultry. Um, it causes major problems. It's by far the most serious disease of, of poultry in, in the world. Um, it, it originated in the USA quite some time ago, and it is primarily a virus that was carried by migratory water birds. So as these migratory water birds came through south in the USA, they would land in uh, ponds, lakes close to poultry farms, and the virus spread to chickens. For an extended period of time, South Africa was free of avian influenza, and we were just about the only country that was free of avian influenza, but now, unfortunately, that's all changed. Mm. We obviously can see that various quarters within the agriculture sector are hard at work. Uh, what are the normal control options for avian influenza? The normal control options pretty much around the world is an eradication program. So because it's such a serious disease of poultry, it, it can literally wipe out a flock in, in three to four days. And also there's the zoonotic aspects of it, um, where, the, where the virus potentially can spread to humans and potentially cause a, a, a serious pandemic. It, the disease is taken very, very seriously. So around the world, most of the effort is based on eradication. So this is done by carefully monitoring the flocks. And if the, if the, the virus is picked up in, in, in a flock, the flock is then culled. So it's what's commonly known as a stamping out policy. And this has been successfully implemented in South Africa. We did have outbreaks in the past in the Western Cape, which were effectively controlled using the stamping out policy. Mm -hmm. However, the problem is if, you, if you're culling the birds, particularly if you start culling the, the breeding birds, there's going to be a shortfall in eggs and, and meat. And this is going to potentially last an, uh, an extended period of time. We're already seeing that, Prof. In fact, uh, uh, the Department of Agriculture is saying that it could take anything between seven to, um, six to seven months in terms of the shortages. I want to go back to the point that you raised in terms of contamination in as far as humans are concerned. We obviously know that there is uh, a consideration to import some vaccines uh, I mean, how long will these vaccines work? Are they effective? And, and I mean, how important are they, uh, particularly in as far as humans are concerned? There's not a lot of countries around the world that are actually vaccinating uh, for avian influenza in poultry. Um, China, Indonesia, Vietnam, um, I think Mexico is vaccinating. The USA is looking at a vaccination program and so is the Netherlands and Germany in, in Europe. They, they've been basically focusing on eradication. But if the once the vaccine is imported and you, you start vaccinating the birds, first of all, you then lose your ability to monitor for the disease. And then secondly, it, it takes a period of time before the birds are protected. Um, it takes plus minus two weeks for the birds to develop um, antibodies against the virus, sufficient antibodies for them to be protected. So, so vaccine is a long-term solution when we admit that we, we've lost the battle against, against avian influenza and then we have to try and protect the flocks. The, the, the aspect of, of the, the virus moving into people at this stage, this is not a, a, a real risk. There is some there's been, I think, only one case in the USA where, where a person has contracted the, the virus from birds. But in the past, um, it has potentially, there, there have been problems with uh, influenza virus from birds and then also influenza viruses from pigs that get into humans. And that, that, that has caused then serious human pandemics like the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic.
Mm. We had another professor who explained um, the likelihood or the, uh, you know, that it's highly unlikely that you would get the influenza from consuming the meat, as an example, um, because of uh, the, you know, the cooking conditions, as well as the acid that is in your stomach. But a lot of people, of course, are very cautious now in as far as that risk um, is concerned, you know, from a human contamination perspective. So those that are staying away from eggs and poultry, you know, how can we get then the sufficient good quality proteins from other sources if we cannot then, uh, you know, consume uh, poultry products? First of all, the, the, I agree that the likelihood of contracting the virus um, from contaminated eggs or from contaminated meat is extremely small. It is, it's an enveloped virus and as such, it's, it's relatively unstable. And definitely the cooking process will, will destroy the virus. The risk of human spread is primarily people that are working on the poultry farms, the people that are coming into contact with live birds. The question of protein, yes, um, poultry eggs and, and poultry meat is a, is a very good and affordable um, source of protein, particularly for lower income people. But th there's a misconception that you can only get protein from meat. There's very good sources of protein in, in plant-based um, foods. And I'm not talking now about the expensive plant-based meat substitute type foods. I'm talking about um, beans, chickpeas, uh, lentils. These are all extremely good sources of, of protein, of good quality protein. So we, we don't need to be totally dependent on, on animal production to get a good supply of protein in. Uh, Prof, just as a final question, as we wrap up our conversation, uh, you know, obviously now uh, we know that there will be a six to seven month shortage in terms of uh, a supply and products, etc. But whilst we are waiting for, you know, the virus, uh, for the, the vaccines, I beg your pardon, what are the best short term control options while we are waiting for it, first of all, to arrive in the country, if it does, and for it to work? The only short-term control option at the moment is good biosecurity. And what I mean by good biosecurity is you need to prevent the virus from getting onto your farm. Um, you need to use good quality disinfectants um, that, that will be able to inactivate and kill the virus. You can use certain products that you can use in the drinking water of birds. You can use certain products that can be sprayed onto the birds. But before you use products like that, for the drinking water or spraying, you need to make sure that those products are registered for that application. There are products on the market that are registered for that application, and that is by far the best way of controlling the, the, the disease and buying time until the vaccine um, arrives and starts uh, protecting the birds. But even then, even still, good biosecurity, even when the vaccine is here, is still critically important. Prof, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much uh, for that interview. Of course, uh, Professor Robert Bragg, he is from the Department of Microbiology and Biochemistry at the University of the Free State.